Comrades, and welcome to today's Omali Taught Me Sunday study featuring Chairman Omali Ishitela. My name is Akile Anai, the Director of Agitation and Propaganda for the African People's Socialist Party, as well as your MC for this morning. Make sure to hit that like button and share this video on the platform you're viewing from. This week, Chairman Omali Ishitela concludes a study on dialectical materialism. He will read from Materialism and the Dialectical Method by Maurice Cornforth, starting on page 77 with the section The Laws of Development. This will be the last study in the series on dialectic materialism, and people are encouraged to read the document in its entirety. The study materials have been linked in the Facebook and YouTube descriptions for your benefit. For the first hour, the chairman will review the study materials, and in the second hour, we'll open it up to you, our live viewers, to ask your questions. It's my honor now to introduce our leadership, the leader of the African nation and the worldwide African revolution, Chairman Amalia Shatella. Uhuru, Chairman. Uhuru, thank you so much, uh, Comrade Director Akile. I'm looking forward uh, to today's study. And as you mentioned, this will be the last uh, part that we will do on Maurice Cornfort's uh, Materialism and the Dialectical Method. Uh, following this, uh, we're moving directly into a study of the political report that has been done for the upcoming uh, 2022 uh, plenary of the African People's Socialist Party. And uh, this will be happening in February. And as is our custom, uh, our responsibility, uh, we start uh, and uh, provide uh, the, uh, the political report um, uh, weeks prior to the actual uh, 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 conference or Congress uh, event that we're having, and sometimes three or four months prior to. And this gives uh, uh, party members and uh, the Uhuru movement members and the public at large an opportunity to uh, read, dissect it, uh, criti critique it, criticize it, uh, if you will, and uh, be prepared uh, to discuss it at the actual plenary or the Congress that we will be dealing with. So uh, that's where we're heading uh, from, uh, from now. From uh, this uh, study, uh, we'll be going uh, uh, to a study of the political report to the 2000, to the third uh, plenary of the seventh Congress of the African People's Socialist Party. So uh, today uh, we are beginning this discussion on uh, the laws of development. This is chapter eight of uh, Cornforth's book, Materialism and the Dialectical Method. <clears throat> this is important. Uh, and it has already been suggested to you uh, by comment director Akile that, uh, that uh, you should look at the entire uh, document that we're studying from. And I would hope that in so doing, you would also uh, uh, try to acquire the discussions that we've had up to now, because I think that that uh, helps to establish a context for looking at Cornforth's work, because uh, 
we're not just looking at corn forth and using it uh, as a kind of um, outline for this discussion. He offers some really important stuff, but we also use it as a kind of foil because we do have some fundamental differences uh, with Cornforth uh, and with uh, the Marxists who have uh, taken the method of, uh, of uh, dialectical uh, and materialist uh, um, uh, investigation and analysis, and they have uh, defined it as a theory. And uh, in so doing, uh, they have uh, placed us with this quandary of having to accept uh, the outcomes of uh, the method of investigation and analysis that's uh, put forth by, by Marx and by people who characterize themselves as Marxists. And of course that defies the whole uh, issue of uh, dialectics and materialism in the sense that uh, this method of investigation and analysis allows us to uh, look at the world uh, even in this process of uh, development uh, coming into being and going out of existence. It's not always the same. And uh, what we are able to discern is that depending on where your location is uh, in society and history and what have you, will uh, depend on how you, what your, uh, your investigation and your analysis will look like. So anyway, I'm gonna go ahead and begin here. I'm going to uh, uh, interrupt this process at some point to uh, to uh, involved with a relatively long excerpt uh, from a uh, political report we gave to our uh, second Congress uh, uh, some years ago. And a part of what we'll be adding to the discussion political report for this upcoming plenary. And the fact is that what we are dealing with now is the uh, 50th anniversary this year, this uh, next year, of the founding of the African People's Socialist Party, 50 years of history, 50 years of struggle, 50 years of uh, development. And uh, this uh, uh, has allowed us to participate in a process that of, uh, of growth. Uh, and uh, we think that uh, we know that we have a lot to contribute to how, uh, how the world should be understood. And we know that uh, as a consequence of the political report, that we'll begin to look at uh, in our next study, uh, and next Sunday for that matter, we will uh, actually uh, affect how uh, everything uh, will be uh, uh, described and understood, that, uh, that uh, it, it will challenge uh, many assumptions that people who characterize themselves as, as uh, thinking representatives of, uh, of the movement in general, of the black movement specifically, uh, it would challenge um, um, many, uh, uh, much of what has been understood to be uh, uh, the reality up to now. I'm gonna move forward then. We're looking at the laws of development. Here's Cornforth on page uh, 77 of the document we're working with. And uh, uh, to understand, uh, development, we must understand the distinction between quantitative change, increase and decrease, and qualitative change, the passing into a new state, the emergence of something new. Quantitative change always leads at a certain critical point to qualitative change. And similarly, qualitative differences and qualitative changes always rest on quantitative differences and quantitative changes. Development must be understood, therefore, not as a simple process of growth, but as a process which passes from quant quantitative changes to open fundamental qualitative changes. Further, this transformation of quantitative into qualitative changes takes place as a result of the conflict or struggle of opposite tendencies which operate on the basis of the contradictions inherent in all things and processes. The Marxist dialectical method therefore teaches us to understand processes of development in terms of the transformation of quantitative into qualitative changes and to seek the grounds and the explanation of such development in the unity and struggle of opposites. What do we mean by development? In stressing the need to study real processes in their movement and in their interconnection, Stalin pointed out 
that in the processes of nature and history, there is always renewal and development where something is always arising and developing, something always disintegrating and dying away. When that which is arising and developing comes to fruition, and that which is disintegrating and dying away finally disappears, there emerges something new. For as we saw in criticizing mechanistic materialism, processes do not always keep repeating the same cycle of changes, but advance from stage to stage as something new continually emerges. emerges. This is the real meaning of the word development. We speak of development where stage by stage, something new keeps emerging. Thus, there's a difference between mere change and development. Development is change proceeding according to its own internal laws from stage to stage. And there's a difference between growth and development. <laughs> this difference is familiar to biologists, for example. Thus, growth means getting bigger, merely quantitative change. But development, meant, development means not getting bigger, but passing into a qualitative new stage, becoming qualitatively different. For example, a caterpillar grows longer and fatter, then it spins itself a cocoon and finally emerges as a butterfly. This is development. A caterpillar grows into a bigger caterpillar, piddle, piddler. it develops into a butterfly. Processes of nature, and history exemplify not merely change, but not merely growth, but development. Can we then reach any conclusions about the general laws of development? This is the further task of materialist dialectics to find what general laws are manifested in all development and to give us therefore the method of approaching for understanding, explaining and controlling development. Quantity and quality the laws of the transformation of quantitative into qualitative changes. This brings us to the two latter features of the Marxist dialectical method as explained by Stalin. The first of these may be called the law of the transformation of quantitative into qualitative change. What does this mean? All change has a quantitative aspect, that is an aspect of mere increase or decrease which does not alter the nature of that which, is it, which changes. But quantitative change, change, increase or decrease cannot go on indefinitely. At a certain point, it always leads to a qualitative change. And at that critical point or nodal point as Hegel called it, the qualitative change takes place relatively suddenly by a leap as it were. For example, if water is being heated, it does not go on getting hotter and hotter indefinitely. At a certain critical temperature, it begins to turn into steam, undergoing a qualitative change from liquid to gas. A cord used to lift a weight may have greater and greater load attached to it, but no cord can lift a load indefinitely great. At a certain point, the cord is bound to break. A boiler may withstand a greater or greater pressure of steam up to the point where it bursts. A variety of plant may be subjected to a series of changes in its conditions of growth for a number of generations, for, for instance, to colder temperatures. The variety continues unchanged until a point is reached where suddenly a qualitative change is induced, a change uh, in the heredity of the plant. In this way, uh, spring wheats have been transformed into winter heats and vice versa as a result of the accumulation of a series of quantitative changes. This law of the transformation of quantitative into qualitative change is also met with in society. Thus, before the system of industrial capitalism came into being there, takes place a process of the accumulation of wealth and money, and money form in a few private hands, largely by colonial plunder, that's interesting, and of the formation of a propertyless proletariat by enclosure and driving the peasants off the land. I wanna read that again there. Um, th this law of the transformation of quantitative into qualitative change also is met with in society. Thus, before the system of industrial capitalism comes into being, there takes place a process of the accumulation of wealth and money form in a few private hands, largely by colonial plunder 
and the formation of a property list proletariat by enclosures and the driving of peasants off the land. It's interesting that, that the colonial question gets thrown in here sort of incidentally, but it's more than that, it's interesting that he talks about the development of society uh, 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 to capitalism uh, by colonial plunder. And that statement is one that leaves those being colonized out of development, do you see? And so it means that as opposed to being a part of this development of human society as defined, as characterized by Marx, we are simply uh, an entity that, uh, that contributes to the development of uh, human society, that is through colonial plunder. We'll talk more about that later, but I hope the point that I was trying to make uh, uh, was, was uh, I, I was successful in doing that. Okay, and so at a certain point in this process, when enough money is accumulated to provide capital for industrial undertakings, when enough people have been proletarianized to provide the labor required, the conditions are matured for the development of industrial capitalism. At this point, an accumulation of quantitative changes give rise to a new qualitative stage in the development of society. Interesting, interesting, interesting. In general, qualitative changes happen with relative suddenness, by leap, something new is suddenly born, though its potentiality has all, was already contained in the gradual evolutionary process of continuous quantitative change which went before. Thus we find that continuous, gradual, quantitative change leads at a certain point to discontinuous, suddenly qualitative change. We have already remarked in an earlier chapter that most of those who have considered the laws of development in nature and society have conceived of this development only in its continuous aspect. This means that they have considered it only from the aspect of a process of growth, of quantitative change, and have not consolidated, have not considered this qualitative aspect. The fact that a certain point in the gradual process of growth, a new quality suddenly appears, a transformation takes place. That's really a kind of description of, of liberals, but that's also a description of general uh, 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 European and uh, colonial society as we, as we will uh, understand moving forward. Yet, uh, because uh, the, the liberals hate, uh, the, the leap in change. They believe in this change and they will fight for the, you know, uh, making this a little better and this a little better, et cetera, et cetera, the quantitative change. But it's qualitative change. It's to move from this kind of society to the other kind of society that we're actually fighting for and that we have to understand the quantitative change must contribute to development as opposed to a simple uh, uh, degree uh, uh, in, in change. Uh, so yet this is what always happens. If you're boiling a kettle, the water suddenly begins to boil when, boiling point, when the boiling point is reached. If you are scrambling eggs, the mixture in the pan suddenly scrambles. And it's the same if you're engaged in changing society. We will only change capitalist society into socialist society when the rule of one class is replaced by the rule of another class. And this is a radical transformation, a leap to a new state of society, a revolution. If on the other hand, we consider quality itself, then qualitative change always arises as a result of accumulation of quantitative changes. And, the, and differences in quality have their basis in differences of quantity. Thus, just as quantitative change must at a certain point give rise to a qualitative change, so if we wish to bring about qualitative change, we must study its quantitative basis and know what must be increased and what diminished if the required change is to be brought about. Natural science teaches us how purely quantitative difference, addition or subtraction makes a qualitative difference in nature. For example, the addition of one proton uh, in the nucleus of an atom makes the transition from one element to another. The atoms of all the elements are formed out of combinations of the same protons and electrons, but a purely quantitative difference between the numbers combined in the atom gives different kinds of atoms of different elements with different chemical property, properties. Thus, uh, an atom consisting of one proton and one electron is a hydrogen, hydrogen atom, 
But if uh, another proton and similar electrons are added, added, it is an atom of helium and so on. Similarly, in chemical compounds, the addition of one atom to a molecule makes the difference between substance and um, uh, between substances with different chemical properties. In general, different qualities have a basis in quantitative differences. So, you know, um, I, I hope this is not confusing. Um, uh, uh, I think that it may be perceived as uh, rather, some of it is rather uh, uh, redundant or unnecessary, but, um, but it's okay. So, uh, as Engels put it in nature, in a matter uh, exactly fixed for each individual case, qualitative changes can only occur by the quantitative addition or subtraction of matter or motion. All qualitative differences in nature rest on differences of chemical composition or on different quantities uh, or forms of motion or as is almost always the case on both. Hence, it is impossible to alter the quality of a body without addition or subtraction of matter or motion, i.e. without quantitative alteration of the body concerned. Uh, this feature of the dialectical law connecting quality and quantity is familiar to readers of the popular literature about atomic bombs. To make a, a uranium bomb, it is necessary to have the isotope uranium-235. The more common isotope uranium-238 will not do. I think we get the point that the, how quantitative change is uh, something um, uh, is uh, really important for the qualitative uh, uh, change for development, et cetera, and that the kind of uh, the qualitative change that one uh, will uh, 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 attain is also uh, determined in part by, uh, by the quantitative uh, change that we're looking at. Uh, so I want to go to uh, uh, development takes place. Uh, so at the bottom of the uh, of the of the first uh, paragraph, the the, uh, the the second full paragraph on the top of page eighty. Thus, we see that quantitative changes are transformed at a certain point into qualitative changes and qualitative differences rest on quantitative differences. Uh, that's, uh, this is a universal feature of development. What makes such development happen? Uh, development takes place through the unity and struggle of opposites. In general, the reason why in any particular case a quantitative change leads to a qualitative change lies in the very nature, in the content of the particular processes uh, involved. Therefore, in each case, we uh, we in, in each case, we can, if we only know enough, explain just why a qualitative change is inevitable and why it takes place at the point it does. Uh, to explain this, we have to study the facts of the case. We cannot invent an explanation with the aid of dialectics alone. Where an understanding of dialectics help, helps is that it gives us the clue as to where to look. Uh, in a particular case, we may not yet know how and why the change takes place. In that case, we have the task of finding out by investigating the facts of the case. For there is nothing unknowable, no essential mystery or secret, secret of development of the emergence of the qualitatively new. And so uh, Cornford does a lot you know, uh, hereafter uh, in this discussion, showing how quantitative change will lead to qualitative change. And one of the things that we've talked about uh, in the African People's Social Party for a long time uh, is uh, uh, the fact that, uh, that uh, the whole rise of the capitalist social system uh, came about uh, not as it was described by Karl Marx through some uh, uh, contest of, uh, of the feudal peasants, or in fact, it doesn't even make that point. Uh, uh, capitalism came about, Marx was able to say, uh, uh, through this thing they call primitive accumulation, uh, which is an interesting uh, kind of concept. But primitive accumulation, he characterizes essentially um, as, uh, as, as transforming uh, Africa into a warren for the commercial hunting and black skins, this kind of stuff, you know, that, uh, and he talks about how uh, the opium war uh, fought by England against China uh, that uh, uh, brought in so much resources uh, to uh, England. All of this 
is what they what he's referring to uh, as the primitive accumulation of capital, uh, the necessary uh, uh, capitalist accumulation for capitalist production. But he one runs into this uh, contradiction. He says uh, where in order to have a, 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 a capitalist accumulation, uh, there must be capitalist production. But uh, we have to assume in this case uh, that the accumulation of capital did not start as a consequence, check this out, as a consequence of capitalist production. It didn't come about as a consequence of capitalist production, capitalist, uh, capital accumulation, uh, 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 but that uh, this, this primitive accumulation was a, was a starting point. And this, this starting point, he says, has the same significance in political economy as, the, as, as, as original sin in theology. The starting point has the same significance in political economy as original sin in theology. And it was the turning of Africa into a warring for the commercial hunting of black skins, et cetera, et cetera. This, this is where he says it starts. And what he has done is uh, he's called this thing primitive accumulation. Uh, and what he's done is taken the history uh, of, of uh, peoples all around the world outside of Europe uh, and made us auxiliary forces. He summed us up, uh, we've become objects of European history. Uh, 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 summed us up in a fashion that uh, we are significant only as it contributes to the development of Europe, which he characterizes as the development of human society. He has created a general law of, a, of social development uh, that, uh, re that uh, requires uh, this, this, this uh, primitive accumulation of capital, the turning of Africa into a war for commercial hunting of black skins, et cetera, et cetera, uh, the, the, the attack on China, the, the opium war, all of this goes into uh, the process of developing Europe, uh, of capitalism. Uh, and, and he's defining this capitalism as Europe, and he's doing what Cornforth did earlier when he talked about how uh, this development happens, this uh, accumulation of capital happened, he says, largely through, uh, through uh, colonial plunder. So, so what they're doing is describing uh, and characterizing the development of, 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 of social, of a human society, uh, where uh, Europeans, uh, the colonizers, are uh, the only ones who, uh, uh, this is from the perspective of the colonizer. And, uh, and the rest of us function exists only as objects that contribute to uh, this development that, that Marx and the Marxists talk about. So I want to say that what we've said is that Marx is wrong and the Marxists have been wrong. Marx just determined using a process of uh, dialectical materialism as applied to society, which is characterized as historical materialism, he has uh, concluded uh, that uh, there have been uh, several modes of production in, and uh, these modes of production is how societies uh, get their existence, get their lives. It has to do uh, uh, with the forces uh, 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 of production uh, and the relations of production, how people have to get together, resources they have to use in order to produce. And these relations, uh, 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 codified in, in laws and, and, and various other kinds of things like that. So you have this forces, you have this mode of production. The mode of production is a really critical question. And so what Marx uh, did was uh, say that uh, the modes of production moved from uh, what he called primitive communism, uh, when uh, there, were, there were no classes, no class struggles, uh, things were shared uh, collectively in society, no oppression of women, uh, uh, et cetera. And then from this mode of production that's required called primitive communism, uh, then uh, Marx uh, defines a uh, movement toward uh, the slavery. In this instance, uh, he's talking about slavery, not the one that we are so familiar with, but uh, he's talking about slavery that happened in ancient uh, 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 Europe. He's talking about the uh, the Romans, uh, uh, you know, you know, back in uh, earlier points of time in history, and so he said this mode of production is one that was characterized primarily uh, by relations that existed between the uh, the slave owner uh, and the slave, those who uh, are enslaved, and that 
uh, in this relationship, the slave owner owns the human being, owns the product of the labor of the human being, and the human being owns nothing except the uh, nothing at all. And so uh, this is this is a mode of production. And Marx talks about this mode of production, talking about historical materialism or dialectic materialism applied to society as something that develops. You know, goes through this quantitative process of development uh, from uh, from slavery. Uh, to feudalism, and then with the feudalism, you have a situation where uh, the human beings are not owned like property uh, anymore, uh, but that uh, the land is owned by the landlords, by the nobility. And the split in society is between the landlords, the nobility, and the peasants and the serfs. And that the peasants and serfs, though not enslaved, generally speaking, formally, uh, they, uh, the land that they work on is owned uh, by the landlord and the peasants and the serfs can only keep a portion of what it is that they create for themselves, the rest going to the nobility and the landlords. This was a mode of production, but a primary contradiction exists between the peasants, the serfs, uh, and the landlords, the landowners, nobility, et cetera. That's, that's the, those are the relations of production that exist uh, within uh, this uh, feudal uh, uh, society that we've just talked about. And then uh, uh, Marx says that uh, something happens and uh, unfortunately he is incapable of, 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 of uh, allowing just the, what happens inside feudal society itself to be uh, the essential determining factor of the movement toward uh, to, to capitalism. Uh, he comes up with this, uh, primitive accumulation of capital that is the basis for the rise of capitalism. This is what Marx does himself. And what we are saying is that Marx missed the boat, uh, that uh, this need, this requirement uh, by uh, the superstructure of a, of a feudal society uh, would not allow uh, that society to see uh, development happening uh, essentially uh, as a consequence of colonialism. It had to decide, it determined that development was something that it was uh, responsible for, for its own uh, 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 definition, self uh, definition. This is, this is what happened with that kind of society. Uh, and so uh, Marx missed the boat here. And we said that a, a new mode of production came into existence. Uh, from European feudalism, a new mode of production that changed the world, uh, that changed the relations of the peoples in the world, and that, uh, that we've been struggling with uh, uh, since that time. And certainly the colonized of us have been struggling with since that time. And uh, I wanted to just share with you this from, um, from uh, uh, the political report that uh, I'm working on now that quotes uh, uh, makes a significant quote from uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, political report to the second Congress. And um, let me just, uh, let me just uh, read this. So it says that the party was in the vanguard of, of characterizing the conditions of existence of Africans in the US as colonialism, far ahead of anyone else. Our stance was always in opposition to the liberal and idealistic declaration of racism as a condition we are fighting. We were constantly in our practice and our developing theory, collecting evidence, collecting the evidence of colonialism being more than merely bad thoughts in, in white people's heads or, or a policy of various European powers. Colonialism was revealing itself to be a mode of production, just like feudalism was a mode of production. Uh, just, uh, uh, it, it, it has to be understood in this fashion. Uh, and so we said one popular reference we've used to make this point comes from Hosea Jaffe. In his book, A History of Africa, Jaffe provides historical evidence of the process of European colonialism destroying and replacing the feudal mode of production in Europe and becoming a mode of production embracing the world. Jaffe's book also reveals the material basis for European opportunism and for racism 
as part of the superstructure stemming from this colonial mode of production. So uh, we unite with, 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 with Marx and, and with Cornforth in terms of looking at how quantitative uh, change over a period of time can lead to a, a leap, a difference, a qualitative uh, uh, change, and as to say, of, of development, uh, more than just growth of the development, because most of the people, Marx is included, who talk about colonialism as it relates to Europe, uh, to North America, et cetera, speaks of colonialism as contributing to the development or lack thereof of Europe. And that's uh, they missed the boat when they deal uh, with that in that fashion. The book is related to uh, e Africa, the political report to our party's third Congress, quoted Jaffe extensively from his book, A History of Africa, which provides a historic record uh, of the development of parasitic capitalism out of the enslavement of Africa given rise to the European or white world. Jaffe de Jaffe's details of Europe's relentless assault on and conquest of Africa provide the material basis for the consolidation of Europe and the amassing of European and consequently North American wealth that is considered the Western way of life by white people, including its advanced representatives uh, of the so-called white left. So um, uh, the Portuguese, and we're gonna talk about this, this, and, and we're quoting Jaffe now, but subsequent to Jaffe, others have written extensively about this and it's really important, but neither, and Jaffe talks about it, uh, but was not able to characterize what he's talking about specifically uh, definitively as a mode of production, though he describes this mode of production. And this is what we've talked about in the past, because even as he talks about what it is that constitutes a mode of what he, he talks about all of the elements that really constitute a mode of production, uh, he too uh, is uh, trapped by um, the language that has that that has come from Marxists who define uh, the the world and modes of production differently. So he's accepted more or less the definition of a mode of production uh, on the one hand that's come from uh, from Marx. Uh, but on the other hand, he's providing all the evidence that this definition is wrong. And so let's look at uh, what we have to say here. So here's Jaffe. Uh, the Portuguese seized the Azores in 1431, and Pope Martin V legalized an already established European slave trade. 1431, we're talking about here. In 1445, the Portuguese began slavery from Gori off Senegal. By 1447, they had reached the Gambia River and the first marked African resistance was reported when they tried to extend the slave traffic in Guinea. By 1460, missionaries were slaving in the, in, in the Congo using Angola, uh, the Kumbundu King. In 1462, the Portuguese were in Sierra Leone. In 1469, Gomez was threatening the civilization of Ghana. In 1471, Fernando Poe uh, penetrated the Cameroon coast. In 1482, the Portuguese were erecting their fortified slaving posts at Adamina and Sao Miguel uh, in Guinea and Lunada. In 1482-85, Diego Cao uh, slaved up the Congo River and down as far as Namibia. In 1482-85 through 85, Diego Cao uh, slaved up the Congo River and down as far as Namibia. In 1440, in 1484, uh, De Abier uh, came armed uh, into the Benin court of Namibian Koi Koi, uh, uh, fought off uh, and, and, and into the Benin, Benin court and Namibian Koi Koi fought off Cao's uh, conquistadors. Uh, financing the Portuguese, financing the Portuguese, and accompanying them on some of their voyages were Germans from the old Hanseatic League, particularly from Antwerp, Frankfurt, and Hamburg. Hidden German colonialism was beginning. In 1487, Koi Koi and tribalists resisted Bartolomeu Diaz armed bands, but Diaz succeeded in rounding the Cape of Good Hope. In 1488, the Portuguese missionary uh, do uh, Covilha 
tried to undermine the feudal regime of Iskander in Ethiopia. By 1490, Arguin was shipping a thousand slaves a year to Portugal and his fortress town of Domina. A plantation economy was started in Santiago, Cape Verde. By about 1500, Portugal alone had taken some 700 tons of gold out of Africa, a massive primary accumulation for nation still weak capitalism worth in today's money, uh, 8 billion US dollars. Uh, the first installment of some 13,500 tons of gold worth about 160 billion US dollars estimated by Moni of Dakar and, and Paris universities to have come out of the Niger uh, Sudan complex alone during the whole colonial period. See all this, all this resources, all this capital? By 1490, Sao Tome was a slave port and slaving and sugar plantations worked by slave labor had reached Benin itself, where the king was corrupted by missionaries. In, in the same year, the missionaries were baptizing those chiefs who collaborated while Wolof and other people were opposing armed resistance to the slavers. The capture of Granada, the last Arab uh, stronghold uh, in Spain by Spanish mercantile feudalism in 1492, paved the way for an even more rapid escalation of European colonialism in Africa. By 1500, Vasco da Gama began in the Portuguese destruction of the civilization of Zanzi and to a, a lesser degree of uh, Mono Motapa. And from then on, all three types of African despotism began to oppose mass resistance to the Europeans. By 1503, Lisbon was already exporting African slaves to the Spanish slave owners in the West Indies and Portugal had surrounded almost the whole of Africa with his armies of slavers. In 1493, Pope Alexander VI had divided the world into Spanish and Portuguese spheres of interest, in effect pronouncing for the first time that Europe was to rule the world. Uh, and then he continues, the 15th century then <clears throat> saw the multiplication of the primary accumulation of European capitalism and Africa played the most important part in the process of, as the principal arena of European colonialism, the very genesis and foundation of the capitalist system. From the turn of the 16th century, the Americas and Asia were added to this foundation. And out of this totality arose capitalism and modern Europe itself. Before capitalist colonialism, there was no Europe, only a collection of feudal, mercantile and tribal towns, farms, villages, discrete states and kingdoms vying and warring with each other just as in Africa, but on a different property basis, that of private property in the land. Europe then was neither a concept nor a reality, at most a vague idea that Arabs, but not Europeans, had had long ago of some place northwest of Greece. As long as Europe remained isolated from the world, there was no Europe. When it became connected uh, with and dependent on first Africa, then the Americas, and finally Asia, it became a reality and an idea. Only when Portuguese, Spanish, French, Italian, Dutch, England, German, Danish, and Swedish confronted and clashed with Africa, America, and Asia, did the need arise for them to consider themselves as a set, a whole, different from, hostile to, and eventually superior to Africans, uh, Aboriginal Americans, and Asians. Uh, colonialism gave them a common interest. This common interest, slaving, plantations, the world market, looting, precious metals, spices, and territory, markets and sources of wealth, was also the source of the conflict among themselves. From 1500 on, they had already started to quarrel and fight over the colonial booty. In these intra-European conflicts, Portugal and Spain had in time to give away to Holland and France. And, and these uh, in the 18th century to Britain, while German, hidden colonialists, Calvinists, Catholics, and Jews alike steadily gar garnered what they could of the booty without shedding their blood or losing their own property in the process. The scramble for Africa that led 
to the 1884-85 Berlin Conference had its roots in four centuries of struggles between the European powers for the division of Africa. Colonialism, the basis of European unity, was also the basis of disunity. Europe was born out of colonialism as the exploiting, oppressing, negating pole that tried always to destroy and assimilate its opposite pole, the rest of the world. The first form was that of primary accumulation from the 14th century to the 19th. The next was that of regular accumulation with an inertial momentum carried forward from the primary accumulation. With, with, with capitalism arose Europe uh, and with Europe, the myth of European civilization, a civilization based on African slavery, American plantations, Asian spices, precious metals from all three non-European continents, based too on Indian numerals, Arab algebra, astrology, and navigation, and Arab Indian took the gama to India from uh, Mombasa and Chinese gunpowder, paper, and compasses. This non-European European civilization was a Narcissus-like admiration of its own conquest, the sword, gunfire, murder, rape, robbery, and slavery formed the real material basis for the idea of European superiority. It was out of this process that the very idea of a European man arose, an idea that, that, that did not exist even in etymology before the 17th century. Before the slave trade in Africa, there was neither a Europe or nor a European. Finally, with European arose the myth of European superiority and separate uh, existence as a special species or race. There arose indeed the myth of race in general unknown to mankind before. Uh, even the word did not exist <clears throat> before the lingua franca of the Crusades. The particular myth that there was a creature called a European which implied from the beginning a white man. Colonialism, especially in Africa, created the concept and ideology of race. Before capitalist colonialism, there were no races, but now suddenly and increasingly there were races. Once born, the myth grew into a reality. So um, I just wanted to uh, just say this, that uh, uh, the last thing I want to read from this is that the chronology of the expansion of colonialism in the 16th, 17th, 18th, and 19th century is also the chronology of racialism. But it is at the same time a history of struggles between capitalist colonialism and the lost past. <clears throat> colonialism won this war clearly and thoroughly everywhere, but it could not win by merely destroying the lost, lost past. It had to transform it, to assimilate its exploitative and non communal features into capitalism itself and reshape the communal features to make them part of the capitalism. The process of transforming the enemy into a part of the victor was long and difficult for Europe. The resistance was never ending. Many African people still say they were conquered and dispossessed, but never defeated and subjected in spirit. Nor was this resistance uh, even and simple, and that it is with the complexity of it that we are now concerned. So I, I wanted to go through all of this uh, uh, from, uh, uh, from Jaffe. Because uh, I think it's uh, just a real concrete um, uh, 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 discussion and, and evidence of a kind of a cumulative, uh, the kind of uh, quantitative change that happened uh, so that uh, you had uh, the water being heated all this time where Europeans were running all around the world, kidnapping uh, peoples, uh, stealing and taking resources from around the world. Uh, and, and this is the thing that Marx characterized as this uh, primitive accumulation of capital. So it was something that happened only uh, that the rest of us were turned into objects of European history. Europe was the subject uh, and, and we became objects and, and uh, Europe could not see uh, us um, uh, and was blinded uh, by its own narcissism uh, uh, to uh, paraphrase uh, Jaffe here. And uh, so a whole new process was coming into existence and the significance of which I think that we'll understand better as we move forward with this discussion. But what we now see uh, is the emergence of this uh, unity of opposites. So the world has changed considerably as a consequence of Europe, of what now, of, of the process of developing Europe, which is the process of developing world economy, which is the world economy 
that was uh, pulled together through colonialism. <clears throat> this is the new world. It wasn't just something that was <clears throat> important in Mississippi or important just in, in uh, Manchester in England or something to that effect. The whole world economy has changed. It, it, the fact the whole world became a world economy as a consequence of colonialism, as a consequence of this looting expedition that, that Europeans uh, went on. And uh, part of the basis of that, of course, was that Europe itself was impoverished, starving, and under uh, and uh, extraordinarily oppressed. Uh, this was during that whole, that's what feudalism was about. And uh, to the extent that, that it was those circumstances that thrust Europeans out of Europe uh, into the rest of the world, uh, then uh, we can see uh, this movement from feudalism to another uh, situation. This is what would be characterized by Marx as development, by the Marxists as development, because what happened was it was colonialism, slavery, genocide against oppressed peoples around the world that developed Europe. And Europeans were able, the colonizers were able to see the murder uh, see the enslavement, see the oppression and theft of land, annexations of, of uh, territories and things like that as development. It was a positive experience. It's been described as positive by Europeans, uh, no matter what walk of life they've experienced. So we would see some evidence of that, you know, uh, as we move further with this study. <clears throat> but for the rest of us, we were, we were silenced. We were voiceless. We had no part of this discussion of what was progressive and what was not progressive clearly what was happening to the indigenous people in the Americas being wiped out and near genocide being committed before the, even the word genocide came into existence, clearly it wasn't progressive. Clearly the attack on Africa uh, that uh, uh, stole so many of African people from the continent of Africa and contributed to changing uh, the world ecolo ecologically, not uh, uh, in addition to what happened economically, we, we were not talking about something that was progressive that was happening to us. The consciousness that talked about progressiveness was a colonial consciousness. It was the colonizer who uh, was experiencing benefit from this and not only the colonial ruling class, but ultimately those who uh, would become what was characterized as a proletarian in Europe um, were benefited. This was progressive for them as well. <clears throat> and, it's, uh, and what we're looking at is the is the emergence of this, this, this new mode of production uh, that is defined essentially uh, by the uh, relationship between the colonizer and the colonized, by the fact that you have a situation where whole peoples now uh, live uh, at the expense of other peoples. You have uh, a situation that has become uh, 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 a part of the world economy, not just an instance where this happened uh, uh, where Rome might have uh, done this and Greece might have did done this in terms of its own population. Now the world now is connected to this process and uh, all of us are connected. They, 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 the fact is that you have a unity of opposites that exists uh, between what is characterized as a slave and the slave master. Uh, all the, the existence uh, 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 requires that relationship. Uh, all existence in that society requires that relationship. The assault on that relationship is the assault on this unity of opposites that, that we're looking at that, again, where each uh, requires the other uh, for its own, for, for its own uh, definition. So uh, hope, uh, I hope I'm not being too uh, uh, difficult in explaining this, but I want to just move uh, a little further with the corn for. Uh, And I think it's what's really important is that we look again, <clears throat> when we're looking at Cornforth uh, on page uh, 81, where we talk about, uh, uh, in general, the reasons why in any particular case, a quantitative change leads to a qualitative change lies in the very nature of the content of the particular processes involved. Therefore, in each case, we can, if we only know enough, explain just why a qualitative change is inevitable and why it takes place uh, at the point it does. This is why we have talked about in the African People's Socialist Party uh, for a while now about this uneasy equilibrium that exists in the world. It's a contest between the past 
uh, and the future. As, as long as there is no obvious uh, and deep uh, 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 a, a meaningful uh, kind of uh, change uh, in this relationship of the uh, colonial mode of production. So there seems to be a kind of balance. It, it, it only is only uh, temporary it, uh, because uh, uh, from time to time you see disruptions and eruptions. So you, what we're looking at is a unity of opposites uh, and uh, unity and struggles that exist inside a process. Uh, and the, the, the unity is conditional. When I say a process, like slavery is the process that we might look at. Instance, in this instance, colonialism, uh, as we characterize as the process that we look like, it is the mode of production. And uh, this mode of production uh, uh, is comprised too, like uh, all uh, processes uh, in nature and in, in, in the world, uh, it is comprised of, uh, of a unity of opposites. Uh, it is, uh, uh, that's what comprises it. Uh, and like you cannot, you know, we say a unity of opposites, you recognize there cannot be uh, 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 an in without an out. This, there's, they're opposites, but they're united. They each require the other for uh, definition. Uh, there can't be an up without a down. They are different, but the, the fact is that there's, there is unity in that they require, each requires the other for its existence. Um, and so uh, in, in processes, uh, what you see is that the, the unity is conditional. Uh, and, and the relationship uh, that we have as colonized people or the colonial mode of production, that unity is conditional. Uh, but the, 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 on, the struggle is, is there all the time. This struggle, uh, unity and struggle is what comprises uh, all contradictions in life and in nature, unity and struggle. Uh, the unity is conditional. It, re it depends on certain kinds of things of whether or not this, this social system, this, this entity will continue to exist uh, as it does. Uh, um, that's why we talked about, again, an uneasy equilibrium. This is an equilibrium that's necessary for the continuing existence of a colonial capitalist system, this balance that's there. But it's conditional. And when we say conditional, because there are constant struggles uh, that's going on all the time. Uh, and this unity is, so we say that the unity is conditional, uh, but the struggle is permanent. It's always struggle there. And this is something that's, it's really important for us to understand. So, uh, and uh, let's, let's consider, this is corn forth on the second to the bottom paragraph uh, on page 81. Let us consider, for example, the case of the qualitative change, which takes place when water boils. When heat is applied to a mass of water contained in a kettle, then the effect is to increase the motion of the molecules composing the water. So long as the water remains in its liquid state, the forces of attraction between the molecules are sufficient to ensure that though some of the surface molecules are continually escaping, the whole mass coheres, to, coheres together as a mass of water inside the kettle. At boiling point, however, the motion of the molecules has become sufficiently violent for a large number of them to begin, to begin jumping out of the mass. A qualitative change is therefore observed. The water boils to bubble and the whole mass is rapidly transformed into steam. This change evidently occurs as a result of the opposition operating within the mass of water. The tendency of the molecules to move apart and jump free versus the force of attraction between them. The former tendency is reinforced uh, to the point it overcomes the latter uh, as a result of this case of the external application of heat. Another example uh, we have considered is that of a cord, which breaks when its load becomes too great. Here again, the qualitative change takes place as a result of the opposition between up, uh, set, opposition set up between the tensile strength of the cord and the pull of the load. Again, when a spring wheat is transformed into a winter wheat, this is a result of the opposition between the plant's conservatism and the changing conditions of growth and development to which it is subjected. At a certain point, the influence of the latter overcomes the former. These examples prepare us for the general conclusion that as Stalin puts it, the internal content of the process of development, the internal content of the transformation of quantitative changes into qualitative changes consists in the struggle of opposites between ten opposite tendencies 
uh, opposite forces within the things and processes concerned. Thus the law that quantitative changes are transformed into qualitative changes and that the differences in quality are based in differences in quantity leads us to the law of the unity of struggle of opposites, the unity and struggle of opposites. And let's go back here. It says that uh, the general conclusion, these examples prepare us for the general conclusion that as Stalin put it, the internal content of the process of development, the internal content of the transformation of quantitative changes into qualitative changes uh, uh, consists in the struggle of opposites, opposite tendencies, et cetera, et cetera. But the problem is that Europeans were unable to see the whole of the internal contradiction because the internal contradiction now is no longer what happens within these feudal uh, entities. The feudal entities have disappeared. The, the, the fact is that there is not a Europe where there was not a Europe. The fact is that there is a Europe because of its relationship uh, that has come through the ongoing uh, capture of resources and human beings. The, the, the fact is that the internal content is different now. You're not looking at the same internal country, uh, con uh, 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 conflict that was looked at as when you were just looking at what was happening, what was to become France or what was Germany, etc. You're not looking at just some feudalism that's happening in France and the Paris, uh, you know, uh, uprisings and, and, and uh, revolution, that kind of thing, because it's much bigger than that. The Paris that was involved in revolution uh, uh, was also connected to uh, the revolution that was happening in Haiti. There's a whole different world now. There's not just these little entities existing uh, side by side in some casual relationship. That's what metaphysics is all about. And this is a discussion that helps us to understand the difference in dialectics and metaphysics. And many of the people who consider themselves Marxists and Marxism, Marx himself to an extent uh, was not able to escape a framework, an ideological framework of uh, that stems from uh, the uh, the the colonialism uh, as it is developing. And when it develops and changes into something else, uh, the Marxists and the European colonialists were able to only see growth. They were not able to see this major transformation, this development that had occurred uh, as a consequence of Europe's uh, 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 looting, stealing, and pulling together, uh, robbing of, of, of the vandalism that it has imposed on the rest of the world has uh, taken land and properties and people from people. There's a whole new world now, but they are moving and understanding it from the perspective, this narrow perspective that they started off with where Europe is the subject of everything and the rest of us are simply objects of the European history. So that's the kind of thing that we're looking at. And that's what I'm hoping that, uh, uh, that if nothing else comes out of this discussion, I'm hoping that uh, we will come uh, to the studies that we'll be doing with the political report uh, to the third plenary of our seventh Congress. Uh, and this is a, a, a leap forward, if you will, in the whole development of understanding uh, uh, historical materialism and understanding uh, uh, how to perceive and analyze uh, uh, the world in a fashion that favors the overturning of a social system. Because you can't overturn a social system unless you know what it is that the social system uh, is comprised of. Uh, you know, unless you are uh, relying on some kind of accident, unless you're relying, uh, relying on uh, some uh, religious phenomenon or something to that effect. Uh, the social system, you're not dealing with the social system. It's like the whole struggle all the time to get rid of fascism or the struggle to get rid of this, uh, this uh, symptom of a contradiction that, uh, that affects uh, the, the colonizer in, a, in, in deep and profound ways. Uh, but the colonizer, the existence of the colonizer requires uh, the colonized. It requires this pedestal of colonial domination of the world if we're going to understand it. And that's what we talk about when we have introduced, we've been dealing with this question of colonialism forever. We've refused to uh, accept the notion that somehow central to the, the development of the world was white people, uh, the colonizers, uh, and we refuse to believe uh, uh, that this concept, what we were struggling against, some idea called racism that doesn't tell us a damn thing about what it is that we're contending with, but colonialism does. It defines a particular kind of relationship in a materialist way. And that's why we uh, talk about that. And more than that, we have come to understand this process of colonialism that gave rise to Europe 
moved from just a policy, and it was a policy of different European entities uh, to, go, to go out and loot somebody, and, and this becomes a means by which you can change your circumstances in Belgium or change your circumstances uh, in France, uh, et cetera. But what happens is that uh, this, this ongoing process of quantitative uh, change through colonialism uh, meant that uh, we saw the emergence of a mode of production called colonialism that thrust this thing called Europe and the white man into existence that did not exist before. It is now coming to existence a whole new social system uh, that people refer to as capitalism, they refer to as capitalism because they're speaking again uh, from the perspective of the colonizer who defines reality based, uh, even though he uses uh, uh, or misuses this, this, this method of investigation and analysis called uh, uh, historical materialism, dialectical materialism, he's defining the, the world in a very narrow way because the world is not the world, the world is, uh, is, uh, is Europe. And despite the fact that the, the, some of us are referenced in different parts of this discussion from time to time, it, we are referenced from the perspective of how uh, we impact on the development of what has now come to be known as Europe. Uh, uh, let me, uh, so, I mean, this is part of what we need to understand. I want everybody, I really want to call on you to, uh, to, to, to read the rest of this. Uh, uh, and, and to read it, uh, hopefully, uh, being informed in part by uh, the contributions that I've tried to make here. And then, of course, I want uh, you to come to uh, next week's study, where we'll be starting uh, the political report to uh, the third plenary of the party's seventh Congress. And we'll be deepening uh, this uh, uh, development, this uh, understanding of, of, of colonialism as a mode of production and setting history aright and setting us in a proper direction to overturn a social system uh, that came into existence through uh, genocide uh, and, uh, and slave, enslaved labor. And we wanna challenge the notion uh, that this was something progressive in the development of human society as Marxists have called it, as, 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 as uh, people who have seen the world through the lenses of the colonizers were able to say it because it was progressive uh, for Europe. It was progressive for Europe that by 1500, Portugal alone had taken some 700 tons of gold uh, out of Africa. That's just Portugal. And then if you look at all of what was looted uh, from Africa, it was progressive for them, but the damn sure wasn't progressive for Africa. And uh, uh, when you look at uh, pro progress uh, and uh, or toward capitalism, what was progressive about it that uh, resulted in, in the genocide of, of uh, indigenous people who didn't even exist in that fashion because the word genocide was only uh, created. The word genocide was only created in the 1940s because uh, it related to white people, the Europeans, what Europeans had done to Europeans. Certainly what was happening to the indigenous people was not considered progressive by indigenous people until we uh, were put in a situation where we had to see the world through the eyes of the colonizer. Then I'm not surprised if we hear Africans and others who are colonized speak to our reality uh, as progressive uh, uh, and, 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 and somehow uh, as a part of this progressive process of development, Africans and the rest of us are waiting to catch up to Europe uh, to become what Europe uh, is, et cetera, uh, which is nonsense. Uh, and I think that the moment we come to understand uh, uh, the, 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 the colonialism as a mode of production that uh, gave rise and birth to the whole social system, uh, then uh, to the extent that we understand that, then we um, uh, put in a better uh, position to change history, uh, to transform uh, the societies that we live in so that people can be uh, genuinely free. And to understand that uh, the struggle of white people, of the colonizers, among themselves, uh, it, 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 a struggle that's being made on a platform of colonial domination. So uh, even when we talk about fascism, uh, it's the, the struggle between white people of, uh, 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 on a platform of colonial domination. Even when you look at what happened January 6th in the United States, you're talking about colonizers fighting among themselves for the colonial booty, for the resources, for a huge sector of the North American or European population that has become demoralized, 
uh, that has uh, 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 cannot see a future in part because of a, a, a decreasing capacity of the United States to keep stealing people's resources because the, it seems that the uprisings of the masses of African people has become a permanent feature uh, in society that challenges everything that existed before because, because European, Europe and European identity itself rests upon uh, the emerge, the co colonialism. And it's the struggle against colonialism that produces movements that of, of white people who are marching in streets carrying torches saying, you will not replace me. Uh, uh, when the fact is that uh, they are being replaced by history. The colonialism is under assault now. It is, and this is the way forward. And everybody who's genuinely uh, interested in changing the world, then you must become interested in the struggle against colonialism under the leadership of the colonized African working class, speaking uh, through uh, the voice of this advanced attachment, leading this struggle, leading the struggle to overturn a social system based on, on uh, uh, the oppression and exploitation of the peoples of the world. Uh, a strategic force, uh, African force, because what we have is a colonial social system, a colonial mode of production uh, that has built into it uh, its own destruction. Uh, that has, uh, through, uh, through colonial slavery, has forcibly dispersed the African people all around the world in every critical location on earth, and particularly, especially in Africa, but not just Africa, also in St. Louis, also in Haiti, also in Cuba and Jamaica and all these other places that this incredibly uh, 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 and powerful potential of revolution uh, that can overturn the whole social system and pull with it all of the other colonized and oppressed peoples of, of the world uh, into a process that human beings can take control of our destiny now, take it out of the hands of the colonizer, destroy colonialism, which destroys the colonizer and the colonized uh, uh, at the same time. That's the struggle that we're engaged in now. Uh, and uh, we're hoping that uh, this discussion contributes to our uh, coming closer to being able uh, to uh, achieve. So, uh, uh, Comrade, Def uh, Comrade Director, how are we looking? Uh, Hello, Chairman. Um, I don't know if you want to just wrap up this particular section in Maurice Cornforth and then uh, getting to the subhead dialect to social development, and then we could stop. Okay, let me uh, wrap up uh, as the, this section. And um, so, uh, where am I now? On page. Uh, 85, I want to go uh, back to uh, the bottom uh, of the paragraph, the last paragraph on page 84. It is from the struggle of opposite tendencies, opposing forces, arising on the basis of contradictions inherent in the social system that social transformation, the leap to a qualitative new stage of social development takes place. This is brilliant. So here, here you have uh, the opposite tendencies, the opposing forces arising on the basis of the contradiction inherent in the social system. And the social system is the colonial mode of production. That's why it's critical for us to understand this because this is uh, the basis uh, for um, making the leap to a qualitative new stage. This is the communism that we're looking for is just beyond uh, this mode of production, this colonial mode of production. And, uh, and the fact is that uh, we are looking at a particular social system. We're not looking at a lot of systems in this instance. We're looking at one social system or dominant, a primary social system, I should say, that is the colonial mode of production. And this is uh, the, the, it's, it's, it's uh, and you have these opposing tendencies. What are the profound opposing tendencies here? What are the opposing forces arising on the basis here? You have the forces of the colonized versus the forces of the colonizers. This is where uh, the struggle is occurring. And say that on page 85, uh, this process has its quantitative aspect. And here, uh, Cornforth, uh, you know, goes back to Europe. Uh, the working class increases in numbers and organization. Capital becomes more concentrated, more centralized, uh, along with the constantly diminishing number of magnets of 
of capital growth, the mass misery, oppression, slavery, degradation, exploitation. But with this too grows the revolt of the working class, a class always increasing in numbers and disciplined, united, organized by the very mechanism of the process of capitalist production itself. And there's a lot of truth to be found here because what is happening with the colonial mode of production, we're seeing a social system that's run into a wall of its limitations. Uh, we're seeing a social system that, uh, 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 that, that uh, does not satisfy the needs, the aspirations of the vast majority of the people where uh, 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 not only are we looking at wars, but assault on the very, uh, the very uh, environment itself, where if, if the human life, uh, certainly uh, human society itself is threatened by the ongoing existence of this social system. Uh, and this is what contributes to our understanding of the significance of this process <coughs> and, and what is progress. And we've always said that progress uh, in human society, that the most progressive uh, feature in human society is the struggle of the oppressed, of the colonized against colonialism. This is the road to freedom, to liberation. And if we understand that the uh, whole, uh, that this, this colonialism is the foundation for the whole capitalist system, it is the road to freedom for everybody. And the Africa and Africans are strategically located to leave this struggle. Uh, strategically, because if you look at what's happening to Africa, even today with the growing immiseration of the people, the violence that's in, uh, happening there on a regular basis, all of the thugs and <laughs> wannabe uh, 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 leaders and dominant uh, forces uh, in the world are concentrated in Africa uh, because of the tremendous amount of resources necessary for, uh, for the, the whole uh, social system uh, to function. Not only that, but then we are as African people scattered around the world and we took with us to Haiti and we took with us to New Jersey and we took to, uh, with us to all these other places we've come from, all of the contradictions uh, that were concentrated in colonial slavery that dispersed us around the world. We didn't uh, leave Africa in, uh, uh, as, as in, in, uh, uh, in a state of colonial slavery and then come to America to be free. Uh, Africans in this country uh, 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 and the indigenous people are the only people who did not come here looking for a better way of life. It was the colonizer who came to here looking for a better way of life and achieved the better way of life, which continues to make our point that colonialism is the foundation. It is the font of, uh, of life and well-being uh, for the colonized at this point of time. So, uh, it's a that again we're looking at uh, uh, following finishing the quote here. Say centralization of the means of production and socialization of labor at last reach a point where they become incompatible with their capitalist integument. Centralization of the means of production, and uh, which is where, and in Europe and increasingly in parts of Asia now, centralization of the means of production and socialization of labor at last reach a point where they become incompatible with their capitalist integument. This integument is burst asunder. The nail of capitalist private property sounds. The expropriators are expropriated. Some people call that reparations. Uh, that's what we're looking at. That's reparations the way we understand the African People's Socialist Party. Uh, in this way, the laws of dialectical development summarize in the principle of the transformation of quantitative into qualitative change and of the unity and struggle of opposites are found at work in the development of society. This development is to be understood in terms of the operation of those laws. And this dialectical understanding, once it becomes a theoretical possession of the working class serves as an indispensable instrument of the working class in, uh, in carrying into effect the socialist transformation of society. Uh, so, uh, is that where you were thinking about, Comrade Director? For Chairman, yep, that's a good place. Okay. So, uh -huh. Uh -huh, Chairman. Um, wow. Well, what a what a way to conclude this study around dialectical materialism and the materialist method. Um, I mean. 
I mean, that was just really profound. And I know we have more to go because we have questions coming in. So I won't take up too much time, but just want to thank you guys for tuning in and go ahead and um, like and share this video. If you're um, whatever platform you're viewing from, go ahead and like and share this video. We're going to go ahead and get into our announcements before we start our question um, and answer section. So this study is being brought to you by the Department of Agitation and Propaganda, where we're winning the war of ideas. For your worldwide revolutionary news and analysis, visit theburningspear.com. You can get more political education from Chairman Amalia Shatella in every issue of the Burning Spear newspaper. Become a subscriber today. Get a one-year subscription, 12 issues delivered straight to your door or your email inbox for $25. Gift a subscription to comrades and family members and sponsor a prisoner. You can do all of this at theburningspear.com slash subscribe. Calling on spear distributors, get the spear out into your community. The January spear is here. So order your bundles right now at burningspearmarketplace.com. Amali Taught Me airs on Black Power 96 FM radio, a project of the African People's Education and Defense Fund with the slogan, not just explaining the world, but changing it. Listen on 96.3 FM in St. Petersburg, Florida, or streaming online at blackpower96.org and on the free Black Power 96 mobile app. The theory of African internationalism is a theory of practice. All of the energy of the African People's Socialist Party is focused on the destruction of colonial capitalism. Africans of the world go to our website, APSPUhuru.org and fill out a contact form. On Saturday, January 8th at 12 p.m. Eastern time, the Black is Back Coalition for Social Justice, Peace and Reparations will host a virtual webinar highlighting the coalition's work in 2021 and what's in store for 2022. Speakers include Black is Back Coalition Chair and APSP Chairman Amalia Shatella, Belinda Parker-Brown, CEO of Louisiana United International, Yejide Orunmila, President of the African National Women's Organization, Ralph Pointer, Chair of the Black is Back Prisoners, Prisoner Political Prisoners Working Group and the Lynn Stewart Committee, Columbai Andanet, the president of the International People's Democratic Uhuru Movement, Betty Davis of the New Abolitionist Movement, who is chair of the Education Working Group, and Zaki Baruti, president general of the Universal African People's Organization. To register, go to tinyurl.com slash deepen struggle. Calling on all party and Uhuru movement members and supporters, attend our 2022 plenary conference of the African People's Socialist Party, February 11th through the 14th. This title of this year's plenary is Relentless, 50 Years of Leadership Toward African Redemption. Our plenaries and congresses have become the vehicles for an ongoing assessment of our work and the conditions in the world affecting our struggle for total liberation and unification of every square inch of Africa and the entire globally dispersed African nation. Registration for this four-day online conference costs just $25. Read the full call to attend by Chairman Amalia Shatella and register by going to APSP plenary.org. Like and follow the Loazy Kinshasa like page on Facebook for more African internationalist political education. Secretary General Loazy Kinshasa does frequent live events such as the War of Ideas series. He includes live sessions done in French as well. To get alerts of when SG Loazy is going live, make sure to like and follow his page today. Uhuru Furniture and Collectibles in both Oakland and Philly are hiring full-time truck drivers and full-time marketing coordinators. If you have driving and furniture lifting skills, social media and print marketing experience, or if you can work Wednesday through Sunday, if you can do those things, apply for these positions and contribute your labor and skills to this institution of the African People's Education and Defense Fund, apply by visiting their website in Oakland, uhurufurniture.blogspot.com, and in Philadelphia, that's uhurufurniturephilly.blogspot.com. On Tuesday nights from 8 to 9 p.m. Eastern, join Ralph Pointer on What's Happening, Blog Talk Radio. Tune in by calling 347-857-3293. Ralph Pointer sits on the Black is Back Coalition Steering Committee and chairs the BIBC's Political Prisoners Working Group and also leads the Lynn Stewart Committee. And we're also calling on people to follow the All African People's Development and Empowerment Project on Facebook or visit developmentforafrica.org for important information and helpful tips in regards to the colonial virus, COVID-19. APDEP has an international telehealth program, which is a free resource for African people to get our COVID-19 related questions and concerns answered by licensed doctors and nurses through Project Black Ankh. You can make your free virtual appointment with one of their professional health providers by going to development for Africa.org slash telehealth. To keep up with our movement events, visit the burningspear.com's events page and subscribe to our mailing list. 
And our last announcement, make sure you like and subscribe to the Burning Spirit TV on YouTube to catch every episode of the O'Malley Taught Me Sunday Study and support the O'Malley Taught Me show by donating now at paypal.me slash O'Malley Taught Me. All right, so that concludes our announcements for today. Thank you guys for your patience. So we're going to get into our Q&A. And of course, we want to acknowledge where you're viewing from. So we have Tampa, Florida, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Minneapolis, Minnesota, Marion County, Georgia, Everton West, Occupied Azania, St. Petersburg, Florida, Richmond, Virginia, St. Louis, Missouri, Battle Creek, Michigan, Huntsville, Alabama, Winter Springs, Florida, Oakland, California, Moorhead, Minnesota, Chicago, Illinois, Ghana, Greenville, South Carolina, Portland, Oregon, Hempstead, New York, Delaware County, Pennsylvania, Lakeland, Florida, Dallas, Texas, Montreal, Canada, Fort Myers, Florida, Kuwait, and Calgary, Canada. So thank you guys for tuning in, no matter where you're located. And Chairman, we had one question um, from last week that we did not get to, and this comes from Comrade Timba in St. Louis, Missouri. And he asked, I heard Chairman, colonialism being a mode of production, how would socialism slash communism look for African people if white workers defeat their bourgeoisie? Well, uh, first of all, uh, we just finished saying that uh, there is no bourgeoisie uh, for white people and another bourgeoisie for African people. The fact is there's one bourgeoisie, generally speaking, even though it's international and uh, the white people are not going to, uh, to defeat their bourgeoisie. The, the, the colonial capitalist uh, mode of production uh, is going to be destroyed as a consequence of the colonizers um, uh, 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 making a successful revolution under the leadership of its advanced attachment, uh, the African working class in the form of the party. So I don't know uh, better than that, Kermit Timber, how to respond to the question about the white people and their bourgeoisie, uh, because that's the bourgeoisie we are all fighting against, Uhuru. And they, they will not do it. Again, we've talked about uh, this whole uh, colonial contradiction and uh, the, the, with left to their own, they, the white so-called working class uh, cannot do it. They can't see, see uh, they, they find themselves uh, sometime in a contest like January 6th, for example, where you see the colonizers fighting among themselves uh, for uh, uh, a control of a colonial state apparatus. So you have groups of white people and, and there's a whole movement throughout this country but it shouldn't be unusual because that's what the whole uh, so-called American Revolution was all about. The white people who came here as colonizers sent by England and other countries uh, who decided that they were gonna keep all the loot from colonialism and the territories and the resources stolen and actually fought a war uh, uh, with, uh, with European colonizers uh, to keep that. And that's happened all over the world. And the thing is, it doesn't get described in that fashion because the colonizer is always telling the story or others tell the story who see the world through the lenses of the colonizer. Uh, but uh, uh, so, so the, even the success of the so-called American Revolution that's, that's highly celebrated uh, by communists alike, uh, uh, as well as ordinary uh, uh, Joe Sixpack, uh, you, you uh, have a situation where the, the fundamental nature of this relationship has not changed. You still have colonial capitalism in power uh, and a social system that's based on genocide uh, 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 and, and, and forced labor. Uh, so Timba, the, 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 it, the, the only way that uh, that can be done is to colonize. If the colonized, uh, if the people of the indigenous people and Africans had defeated uh, the colonizer, then we'd be having a whole different kind of discussion right now, but they ain't going to do it. They can't do it. Uh, uh, it's going to take the colonized to make that happen. Uhuru. Uhuru, Chairman, thank you for that, you know, clarification. And uh, thank you, Timba, for raising the question. So now we're moving into questions from this week. And our first one comes from Comrade Asa, who's in Everton West, occupied as Zanyo, South Africa. Says that Uhuru, I appreciate this education. A note I made is that quantity can lead quantitatively to a qualitative change that might not have been predicted. This meaning that matter is still primary. Can you speak to this mootness of the idea of quote unquote social engineering as espoused by bourgeois parties such as the Illuminati? Please show that the oppressor cannot really comprehend the power of the people. Okay, I'm not sure I understood Asa's question. Is this it's written someplace here, isn't it? Can I see it? Um Let's it's not in the Zoom chat, but I oh, in the Zoom chat. Yeah, can yeah. chat it to you? Yeah, please uh, do. Yes. <clears throat> 
it was like a comment and then a question. So. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, uh, let's see. Yeah, I appreciate this a note I made is that quantity can lead uh, quantitatively to a qualitative change that might not have been predicted. This meaning that matter is still primary. Can you speak to the mootness of the idea of social engineering as espoused by bourgeois parties such as the Illuminati? Please show that the oppressor cannot really comprehend the power of the people. I'm not sure that I understand about the social engineering as uh, espoused by bourgeois parties such as the Illuminati. But uh, the fact is that the oppressor can't really comprehend the power of the people. And uh, to look at even as an example, I've been watching just most recently uh, about uh, how the United States uh, is trying to, and Europe, uh, uh, confounded by uh, uh, the inability to uh, win China and Russia uh, into uh, the same uh, 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 economic camp within this uh, colonial uh, system <laughs> because they treat uh, uh, China and Russia like they have treated uh, Europe uh, and colonized peoples in the instance of China uh, generally. But China became independent, not as a neo-colony, but it fought and raised a, a revolution and, and was able to set its own terms for when it would have any kind of, whether it would have any kind of relationship uh, with the colonial uh, 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 capitalist uh, uh, system at all. And the same thing is true with Russia. Russia is no longer a communist, uh, 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 you know, led by a communist or socialist. Uh, it's a different kind of uh, immediate system there. But Russia came into, uh, 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 Russia came into modernity uh, as a part of the process of the struggle against feudalism. And, and came to where socialists actually seized power, made some important kinds of transformations. And so it's not like the rest of Europe that has its basis in, in the same uh, kind of colonial extraction of value from Africa, from the Caribbean, from other places and needed and, and came into that relationship that kept it fair. It developed independent of that. It developed as a consequence of communist socialists taking power building power uh, uh, and, 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 and tremendous kind of resources that made it unnecessary for them uh, to come in and, and uh, as uh, abject uh, uh, subjects of uh, European, uh, uh, Western European, as they like to call it, or, or, or American uh, uh, supremacy. And the same thing true with China. China didn't have to do that. And so uh, now they, they still continue to try to set their own terms. Of course, the contradiction for us is that both Russia and China, uh, generally speaking, uh, making uh, the struggle for uh, uh, challenging the hegemony of the US uh, still on the platform of the colonial uh, mode of production. The colonial mode of production uh, continues to exist, but uh, the point is that the United States and their thinking representative could not understand uh, China could not understand Russia and cannot understand the power of the people. And it's a bit of the kind of narcissism that we talked about that Jaffe mentioned in terms of the self-perception that uh, European colonizers have. Uh, and, uh, and also uh, this total disdain uh, for the working uh, peoples of the world that is to be found there. So uh, they don't have to understand and they don't understand and they always uh, underestimate the power of the people. And that's why at the last moment in every case, they find themselves standing on top of buildings, trying to hop on the helicopters, getting the hell out of Dodge before the revolutionaries get there or with the airports blocked as in, as in that we just saw in Afghanistan uh, 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 people trying to get the hell out at the last minute. Up until uh, the last minute, they believe in their superiority and the power of the people always surprises them. Uh, uh, and that's that's been the case coming, Asa. Uhura, Chairman, thank you. And thank you, Asa. And um, Carmen Matsumela also put something in the chat, Chairman. Mm -hmm. said, Uhuru, you know, the part in Uneasy Equilibrium where you dispel the notions of Illuminati and stuff like that. And he was thinking maybe that's what Asa was nudging towards, not sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. maybe, maybe that's what it was. Yeah. 
Um, all right, thank you, Chairman. So our next question comes from um, Nanso in Palma de Mallorca, Spain. And um, they ask, do the missionaries play a big role in the enslavement of Africa? The missionaries play the big role in, in enslaving everybody, Nansa. Um, uh, they, they uh, obviously they were uh, sort of like an ideological advanced attachment for the whole uh, colonial project. Uh, the major assault that they made on the uh, belief system of those uh, people uh, who uh, were ultimately brought under colonial domination. We spoke here even uh, the passage we read from Jaffe about how the missionaries corrupted the king uh, uh, in Africa. And that's what they've done uh, historically. So the missionaries played a profound role there in Africa, in the Americas, every place where you look, uh, uh, where uh, Europeans have been as colonizers, uh, you find uh, all the evidence of uh, uh, missionary uh, involvement, uh, encroachment, and what have you. So the answer is yes. Uh, yes, comrade. Nanso. Thank you, Nanso, and thank you, Chairman. Um, our next question comes from Comrade Loiso in Everton West, Occupy Zania. And he says, Ahuru, Chairman, I want to ask if Marxism is an ideology or a mindset. Can you please explain this? Well, uh, uh, I think that uh, Marxism uh, is an ideology and uh, uh, that can be rather confusing for, for some people, uh, but yes. And, and, and when you say it's a mindset, I'm not quite sure um, what kind of distinction you're making when you say an ideology or a mindset. Uh, but yeah, Marxism uh, is an ideology and um, uh, uh, and it was um, an important um, intervention. It was a means by which uh, a dying uh, feudalism, uh, the thinking representatives in a dying feudalism, uh, uh, which meant not only the uh, destruction of certain kinds of uh, uh, economic and political structures, uh, but a whole mode of production was under distress. And, and that meant that the belief system and that mode of production was also uh, uh, being challenged. <laughs> and Marxism was uh, uh, one of the uh, responses. Uh, uh, it was a means by which, uh, one of the methods by which a, a new explanation for the kind of society that, that, uh, we, that was being fought for, sought, uh, would come into being. And uh, so yeah, Marxism, you know, it's an ideology, yes. Uhuru, Chairman, thank you. And thank you, Comrade Luiso, um, uh, for your question. So um, this next question is coming from uh, Sam on YouTube. And um, so I'm gonna, okay. Well, it says, what are we going to do to force the US government to pay reparations to, it says American descendants of slavery, but we're, we're African, um, in order to better position ourselves to defend Africa from its current colonial attacks. Well, first of all, uh, uh, Comrade Sam, a point that we've tried to make is that the African Revolution has run into its limitations when fought within the borders, uh, the colonial borders that have been created for us, whether that's in Africa, whether that's in the Americas or wherever else we're located. Uh, the fact is that we are one Africa. Uh, we are one nation that has been forcibly dispersed. And part of the process that we're involved in is uh, repairing the damage, reparations, if you will. And uh, uh, part of, of what that means ultimately is that the, uh, uh, the expropriators themselves will be expropriated. That is to say, uh, the revolution, uh, ultimately, uh, we believe that the revolution itself would take back the resources stolen uh, from Africa, human and, and material resources. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I don't, uh, I'm trying to understand the question beyond that, uh, Comrade Sam. Uh, I don't, we're not looking for a separate kind of uh, solution. We know, uh, we do not ignore the fact that uh, Africans live in different parts of the world and uh, how the social system uh, uh, may affect us differently at particular locations. For example, reparations, uh, we push for reparations in this country, in the United States but we also push for reparations uh, in, in South Africa. 
Uh, we push for reparations in Ghana and in, 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 in Haiti and various other places because uh, all of those resources that's there, we mobilize the masses of African people uh, to go against those forces, uh, whether they're in the United States directly or indirectly uh, through neo-colonial entities, we mobilize the masses of the people to require reparations and put pressure on, on governments that uh, have been established, neo-colonial governments. Uh, we uh, force them to deal with the question of reparations, force them uh, to uh, have to uh, talk about reclaiming the resources, repairing the damage that, that's been done by European and American uh, 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 colonialism uh, and colonial theft of our resources. So it's one movement and uh, we're fighting on different fronts. Uh, and we believe uh, that uh, ultimately we're gonna have to take it. We, and, and, and I think to look at your question, um, more immediately, the, the thing that we have to do is create a problem uh, for the US that it cannot solve uh, or that it has to try to solve uh, through uh, relinquishing uh, reparations for African people. And, uh, and, and any other even pretext of reparations is, is just gonna be that, that uh, there is going to be a time uh, in this country. And I think we see that happening in different locations in the United States right now, where an attempt to buy off uh, the African revolution uh, is, is, is being made uh, by paying off a sector of the African population, calling it reparations to, uh, to quench uh, the struggle there. And I think that we will see more and more of that as the intensity uh, and capacity of our revolutionary movement grows. And we've seen part of that uh, happen uh, even with the definition of American descendants of slaves uh, 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 and who are fighting for reparations as if it were possible, humanly possible, uh, to make, uh, uh, to distinguish the, uh, the, the resources stolen from Africa and African people uh, in the United States from the pot of resources stolen from Africa and other places around the world. It's one world economy. And uh, uh, that we will make a huge mistake if we don't recognize that even in the struggle, even as we make the struggle in particular locations to force a crisis in the system by demanding reparations, we know that and understand that we don't do that by pitting uh, our struggle in one place against the struggle of African people in other places. Uh, 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 that falls uh, into uh, the hands of our oppressors, Uhuru. Uhuru, thank you, Chairman. And again, that was Sam on YouTube. Um, Uhuru. Um, Comrade Kumba in St. Louis, Missouri asks Uhuru Chairman, what is the title of Jaffe's work and what makes communism the highest form of a mode of production? Well, Jaffe's uh, book is called A History of Africa. And uh, 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 it's because uh, communism uh, presupposes the, uh, uh, the elimination of oppression and exploitation uh, of the people. It presupposes that nobody is living at the expense of the other. It has removed uh, uh, from power uh, a class that expropriates value uh, from, uh, from, uh, from people who produce uh, the wealth. And it has, uh, has removed uh, that class. And it has, and in the process of doing that, it attacks that whole system. And as a consequence of socialists having one power in, in, the, in the initial stage of this, uh, we have uh, transformed uh, the society and practices of the society that's based on exploitation. And we've destroyed the material basis for that uh, through the working uh, people uh, now having control, ownership and control of the means of production. So Kumba, I, I hope you know, uh, that uh, was helpful. If not, you can drop something in the chat and we can say more about it. Uhuru. Uhuru, thank you, Kumba. And thank you, Chairman. Um, Comrade Felicia on YouTube um, asks and states, this government um, in America has unspoken laws in place to permanently oppress Black people as we're seen as three-fifths human, human beings and commodities. How do we change this? We change it by taking power. That's the only way. I mean, the spoken, unspoken law, I mean, it's been, that's been talked about before. It's been referenced in past uh, 
uh, as I was younger and in history books, they call it the difference in de facto uh, versus de jure uh, kind of, uh, of uh, law. That, that there's law, there, there, there's oppression based on law and there's oppression based on fact. And so sometimes people say you're free, but in fact, you're not free. That's what they say, you know, uh, in, in, in by law, uh, there is a so-called freedom of speech and freedom of assembly. But in fact, uh, go to any African community, any place in the world, and you will find that there is no freedom of assembly. There is no freedom of speech. And that's certainly true in the United States where people get killed for uh, assembling uh, uh, at times and places that white power, the colonizer doesn't want us to do that. Saying things that, that they don't want us to say. They killed Malcolm, not because he was running around killing people, but because he said stuff. They killed King, similarly, uh, uh, for the same reason. Fred Hampton, there the, the, the is what they call, uh, there is the difference in, in de facto and de jure, uh, de jure uh, kind of, uh, of, of uh, uh, law and establishment. So yeah, and the way we change that, comrade, is to take power. There is no other way. And we're gonna to have to fight for it. We're gonna to have to take our own power, destroy colonialism. Uh, that's the way forward. And destroying colonialism in the hands, uh, by the hands of the, uh, of the African uh, working class, the advanced detachment of the African working class. Uhuru. Who was that? That was Felicia. Felicia, Uhuru Felicia. Uhuru. Um, let's see, this next question is coming from Comrade Demetria in Portland, Oregon. I want to just say something about the three fifths of a person. Uh, because the government, the United States never said we were three fifths of a person. We were not persons at all. The three fifths they use is uh, what they would uh, use as a counting mechanism in terms of the power and influence uh, that uh, Southerners would have. Uh, in the electoral college and being able uh, to get people uh, voting the number of people they can have in the Congress. So not that Africans were three fifths of a person, but that Africans could count as three fifths of a, of a person uh, for that purpose. And uh, I think that's, yeah, I just wanted to make that statement. I think we really misunderstand that. And I'm not saying that uh, uh, we misunderstand it in a way that's, uh, 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 unfavorable uh, to us. I'm just saying that they didn't even consider us persons. They didn't consider us persons. We didn't have three-fifths rights or anything like that. We had three-fifths of nothing. We were just uh, a means by which uh, they were tallying uh, the uh, power uh, that uh, white people could have in the South versus white people in the North. Uhuru. So come at, uh, uh, who was that come at? Uh, Alicia, yeah. Mm -hmm. And now, come at you were saying. Uh, Demetria. Demetria. In mm -hmm. yeah. Says, Huro, Chairman, please explain why we must understand that this toxic relationship with the colonizers must be destroyed by the African working class around the world. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Comrade Demetria. Comrade Demetria is a really significant force. I mean, she produces, I was talking about her this morning, I think it was uh, last night by somebody, uh, they're in Portland. And um, the, the fact is that um, the, the question she was raised about uh, why, say that again, can you repeat it again uh, for me, comment uh, director, yep. the question that she raised. Um, um, explain why we must understand that this toxic relationship with the colonizers must be destroyed by the African working class around the world. Well, one uh, thing is only the African working class can destroy uh, this uh, contradiction, this relationship. Uh, the only the African working class has no stakes in this relationship. Uh, the African petty bourgeoisie uh, can live and continue to live uh, even if uncomfortably at different times uh, with this system continuing to exist, with this relationship with the colonizers continuing to exist. Uh, even during the era of uh, of uh, colonial slavery, former colonial slavery in the United States, there were Africans who uh, who benefited from uh, from this process. Uh, but the African working class has nothing. In any place in the world, the African working class has nothing, and but misery and greater uh, 
poverty and oppression and humiliation on a regular basis. And uh, uh, it, it will take the African working class uh, to overturn uh, this relationship we have with colonialism precisely because it has nothing to lose at all, nothing. And so uh, it is the critical uh, force and it is the force that um, puts the workers, the producers of value uh, uh, in authority, uh, now become the new owners uh, uh, and forces who control the means of production who uh, the uh, uh, prominent uh, dominant uh, forces in the social system that we give rise to, that's the African uh, working class. That's the only way we will actually know freedom. The African petty bourgeoisie cannot, as a social force, the African petty bourgeoisie will always sell out the interests of the African working class as a social force. That's not to say that they're not individual African petty bourgeois forces who can Abandon, uh, uh, you know, their their their, their interests uh, in uh, the petty bourgeoisie and unite uh, with the interests of the African working class. But as a class, as a social force, the African petty bourgeoisie will always sell out the revolution. Uhuru, comrade. Uhuru. Me. Yeah. Uhuru. Thank you, Comrade Demetria, and thank you, Chairman, and thank you to all of you uh, for your questions. Um, Chairman, we are um, uh, got a little more time left, but um, you know we don't really have any more questions to take. So it, I, we can go ahead and uh, close it out a little bit early if you want to do that, um, and just give us your closing remarks. Well, thank you. Um, I look forward to seeing everybody uh, next Sunday, uh, where we'll begin discussion of the political report to the third plenary of our seventh Congress. And uh, I hope everybody is preparing uh, for that plenary, uh, which will be happening in February and uh, next month, uh, first part of next month. And also, uh, we uh, really initiating a, a celebration of 50 years of leadership, uh, relentless uh, leadership in the struggle against uh, in the struggle for African redemption. And I want to make a distinction here about 50 years of existence of 50 years of leadership. Uh, 50 years of being on the planet, 50 years of fighting for the redemption of Africa, our Africa, uh, our African people, uh, et cetera. That's what, uh, that's what we'll be uh, celebrating uh, uh, coming in in a very serious way, beginning uh, with our plenary uh, in February. And then, of course, as you know, uh, in 2023, uh, we're taking uh, the, uh, the, the Congress of the African People's Socialist Party uh, to Africa itself. And this is going to be a magnificent uh, part, a uh, leap in the process of the redemption of Africa where Africans on the continent and globally will be mobilized uh, to come home uh, and to participate in consolidating the African revolution on a continental wide basis uh, and globally. So uh, I wanna thank you, Comrade Director Keeley uh, and uh, everyone who uh, was able to come on uh, to the studies uh, study on today. And I look forward uh, to uh, discussing with you the uh, political report to the third plenary of our seventh Congress. Uhuru. Uhuru, Chairman. Thank you so much for this study. I think we've done, we've been going over uh, dialectical materialism for 11 weeks um, in total. And so um, I just really wanna appreciate you for taking the time to deepen our understanding around this, um, you know, around this particular topic, but not just the topic, but the question and significance of theory altogether. And the fact that we, the African working class, we have our own theory in the form of African internationalism. We are, we're able to see the world, explain it through our point of view, from our position um, as the colonial pedestal. And um, you have just, when you introduce this theory to the world, you really change the game. Um, and so this has just been a really profound series. As chairman stated, you um, should, continue to look at this study and continue to also look at, you know, um, the works of Chairman Amalia Chatel and the Uhura movement uh, to understand this question um, uh, even better than, you know, Maurice Cornforth was ever to ever able to present it. I'm um, especially on the question of African internationalism, which you can read in books like An Unease Equilibrium and Vanguard, which are available on burningsparemarketplace.com. And as stated, we will be looking at the uh, chapter one of the political report to the third seventh Congress plenary. We're so excited. It is so profound. And um, we're just excited to share and study this uh, document with you all. 
And you can register for the plenary at APSPplenary.org. It's February 11th through the 14th, four days, virtual $25 ticket. So go ahead and make sure you register today. Um, I wanna just thank you all for tuning in. Make sure you like and subscribe to the Burning Spirit TV on YouTube to catch every episode of the Amali Taught Me Sunday Study and continue to support this show by donating to paypal.me slash Amali Taught Me. Want to shout out uh, Comrade Janaba on YouTube who did a super chat today, which is essentially donating. So um, thank you, uh, Comrade Janaba. So that concludes our study this week. We'll catch you all next Sunday. Uhuru, Chairman, thank you. And we salute your leadership. And yeah, we'll talk to you all next Sunday. Uhuru, comrades. Vanguard up. Vanguard up.